But that's what I mean. Don't, don't follow the standard procedures. Find out how you breed innovation. That's going to make time. Breeding things takes time. And the moment you start, it's going to accelerate and keep going. So start now. Put in the pieces for innovation to happen. That's when it happens fast. Slow to start, fast to happen when it does. So while the microphone's going to the other side, so I think uh, uh, Rich had yeah, yeah. he wanted to add. Hire innovators. Yeah. Hire people that think like that. So, and I guess, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a, a reasonably good example that, you know, uh, Mark hates retreads. Everybody know what a retread is? You know, you're in a company, you leave and you come back oh. to retread. He hates retreads because he thinks he's already sucked all the creative stuff out of you. He's done with you. You're off. Uh, but I'll say that, you know, when you interview people and you're looking for people that are self-directed and innovators, there's a special behavioral type questions you need to be asking. You need to be looking through. You need to peel it back. It isn't what's on the resume. It isn't necessarily how they dress. It isn't what school they went to or not. It has to do with that person their persona, how they carry themselves, what they what they have a passion about. So that's what you look for, and that's where you get game-changing ideas, because those people are going to create something new, different, and innovative. Well, and did I, you I like say Mark doesn't recycle? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, last time we had two panelists that knew each other and debated. That was fun, though. Uh, so, we, uh, so actually, to add to that last comment, you, if you have somebody who comes from an innovative environment, they might be on that track already. However, if you go back to my uh, consulting mentor who um, built his entire thesis around that topic, the uh, best innovators will be squashed by leaders who do not support innovation. They won't succeed. So you, you really have to start with creating a culture of innovation and then maybe some quick wins. That'd be my two cents to the, to the topic. All right, so who else has a question? It's like, okay, well, I'll make my way over there. Here and then there. So uh, as a business, does being innovative mean that you have to be first in market? Uh, you know, Apple has always been described as a very innovative company. But if you think about Apple, they not really create, you know, smartphones or small watches. So I was just wondering what the panel would have any comments on that. You said, do you have to be first to market to be an innovator? No. MySpace, Facebook. Okay? There's your beautiful, simple, everyone understands example. We are not the biggest makerspace company in this country right now. There's an 800 pound gorilla. But I tell you what, we think we're the innovators. So no, you don't have to be first. You just have to be creative. And like I said, foster, foster innovation inside an organization. I hope someday, and I think I'm getting there quickly, that I'm the dumbest person in my organization. Because I want to surround myself with people that are brilliant and just give them the freedom and stand back and watch the amazing thing happens. I don't think, you know, Bill Gates gets credit for being a genius. No, he surrounded himself with geniuses. And that's my plan. That's my plan with my board of directors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I ha there's a question here somewhere. Okay. With innovation, you know, comes cost. How do you how do you get that? How do you make the decision to to take that cost to make that innovation? Because sometimes some innovations might come with a higher cost than expected. How how, how would you decide to to take the risk and maybe spend that much more to maybe find that 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 way better way of doing that thing that you were. All right, things my dad told me, no risk, no reward, okay? And then, you know, there's uh, second place is, what is it, first, second place is the first place loser. You have to risk it. Every business, right now, I spent every penny I've earned in my life to put into my business to be the innovator, and I might fail. I don't know what plan B is, but I'm putting it all into plan A, and I'm risking everything. And I think that's what businesses have to do to survive. Go for it, because if you don't, that guy over there is doing it, and she over there is doing it, and they're right behind you, or they're ahead of you. So it takes money to make money, is what my dad always told me. And yes, I'm a struggling startup. I see huge potential. I have to convince others of my potential. They invest in you and your beliefs, and that's how you succeed. I don't think it's a given that an innovation costs money. 
good idea. It makes the operation a lot more effective. You can actually save huge amounts of money. I would say for us, uh, it's calculated risk, and we really uh, don't formally do a decision tree analysis, but in essence, uh, we're willing to take risk, uh, but we calculate those. And as I mentioned before, we're not really pioneers, but we're early followers. And so we try to be the Facebook. Uh, and I think you really have to be willing to uh, continually have this process improvement kind of mindset, like if we're doing what's right this hour, then next hour maybe something different might be better, but maybe it's not worth taking that change right now. I'm gonna wait and get that newer light from wet. Uh, so I think it, it, you, you calculate that, but you have to take some risk or you're gonna you know, be doing some very routine thing that's probably not going to be very emotionally rewarding or successful to your business because there are 9,000 other guys that want to be doing what you're doing. So I think you have to find a way to differentiate yourself. But, you know, it depends on what the life cycle of your business is, too, in terms of how much risk and your growth patterns. I mean, if you look, many companies fail because not because they have a bad idea, but because they grow too quickly and they really don't have the depth that they need and the resources they need to be able to do that. And they're, they would have been better off to do more of a calculated. So I, I think it's always with the innovation filter, uh, but you have to be smart about it. So. Uh, another thing is, uh, let's take an example of product development, right? So you, uh, the product development cycle is not a tunnel, it's a funnel. So you have lots of ideas in the beginning of the funnel, and then slowly you are weeding the uh, not competitive ideas out, and, and hopefully you have a winner at the end. So it takes about 100 ideas to maybe make one viable at the end, maybe. So you got to have lots of good ideas and then be able to from that have a process to weed out the not so good ideas. Uh, it could be business case, it could be return on investment, it could be you know whatever the reasons. But ultimately then it, it, it comes down to uh, a, a successful idea. So it takes a lot of ideas in the process to come up with one good one. Well that, that reminds me of, uh, I think it was Edison who tried like, I don't know, some zillion different ways of uh, uh, working with electricity before he actually invented the light bulb. So uh, actually, uh, Jerome brought this up earlier, and that was that you can, I brought up the word failure because like Edison can say he failed, you know, 10,000 times. Or he learned a new way of doing it 10,000 times. And you have to look at it like a new way of learning. But if someone tells you you failed, I would take that as, great, now what am I going to do next to uh, do it differently? So anyway, I just add that caveat in there. He had a good point. I would add also, Lily, what was just said, that the, it's not that I got this great idea, and the CEO says, okay, we're going to make a commitment to launch. There's many steps. You may start out with a sketch or a drawing of what the new product is, and you go have a focus group with customers, as you say. And many other types of manufacturing technology and what the costs are turning out, and have lots of opportunities to take other paths as you go through that process. So we really focused on a process called stage gate process. So uh, you have all these ideas in the beginning that the stage one comes and then you say okay does is it allowed to go this is like gate one say is it should we let it go to the stage two yes then you have a gate two and you may stop it there. So I know an engineer this is good or bad but I know an engineer in San Francisco, he has been uh, working for 30 years as an engineer and none of his products have come to life. They get killed along the way somewhere. <laughs> Alright, I have another question here. Uh, very informative panel discussion this morning. So, 
what I'm asking is, what's your prediction of the impact of 3D printing technology on innovation over, say, the next three to five years? <laughs> well, I know that I know we have an expert here. We have we have six in our building, and I hope so. Two two things are happening in the 3D printing world. We have the consumer market, the toys everyone's buying for their kids, and we have the professional market. What we're going to do with it? I'm afraid that it's going to be a fad if it's not taught correctly in schools. We teach 3D printing, but we also teach design intent. The most common thing printed in our machines are, are useless toys. They're not being used to their potential. We have to make sure that if 3D printing is taught, it's taught as a powerful tool of manufacturing, not a tool of play. And that's something where we have to work with our schools. On the other side, holy crap. That, that's the only word I can give for 3D printing because I saw the very first 3D printers in the late 80s. They were developed in Valencia, California by 3D systems. No one believed that this large refrigerator sized machine made a chess piece with things inside that were not manufacturable. But it is a game changer. It's a few years out in the metalworking industry. We're not that concerned. Uh, someone came out with a 3D printer about three weeks ago that is 25 to 100 times faster than anything that currently existed. Talk about a hockey stick moment machine. The guy did a TEDx talk. It's amazing, but keep in mind you're printing out of relatively weak plastics, all right? We are gonna be printing human body parts. Just give it a couple of years. We are gonna be printing guns. That's gonna be an issue. We are gonna be printing, we're already printing skulls for human beings. So I think every one of your people in your companies, the, the thinkers, the R&D people, should come take a 3D printing class so they are aware of the realities of it and what, what the current state of the art is. You need to do this. And unfortunately, there's maybe one or two 3D printers in every school within a 100 mile radius, there are no 3D printing classes for our students. So don't expect them to come out of school with that knowledge. Go get yourself a couple thousand dollar 3D printer, park it in your office, send the folks to me to learn how to use it, and you'll see innovation start to happen from that little machine. Interesting idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to uh, make sure that I asked, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Rich, and then I'll ask. I sat through my first class two weeks ago at WET. We have all those machines, too. So we're doing additive engineering and development, plastics and metals and MIMS, and a bunch of different things that create things that you really can't do reductive, you know, production engineering with. But it is the way of the future, and uh, you gotta be out there. So I'm right on, you need to, we need to get that at the school level. I agree with you. Well, and actually, sure. this, somebody answers Sue's question, is rapid prototyping one of the key things used in 3D printing. So speaking of the school level, I wouldn't mind elaborating on what we are doing. <laughs> so I was talking about uh, every student makes a hammer. <laughs> you know, really way of making money. <laughs> so uh, there is a this senior level uh, class, which is called a clinic, where every student has to work with a project from the company. And we choose about 30 projects a year, which we do for companies, and they have to pay us money to do the project, but in one year, that's like two semesters, talk about innovation happens. Out of the box, ideas coming from these students who may not have uh, been an expert on this particular technology, but within like a month, they learn all that, become expert, and then they start thinking beyond that. So example, like right now, uh, we are working with Mazda, and coming up with ideas which are out of the box, uh, which uh, younger generation, the students and you know the younger people can think of, they still don't have those blocks, metal blocks. So clinic is a great example of innovation coming out and within like a time frame. So it's not unlimited time, you have two semesters, at the end here is what we are looking for. A very broad, not narrow scope, saying here is what we are looking for. Solution-wise, they have to come up with innovative solution at the end. I'm a black sheep at 3D printing events for one main reason. 3D printing without CAD, without computer-aided design, is completely useless. So before any of you buy your kids or your companies a 3D printer, give them some lessons on how to draw things in 3D. Otherwise, they're finding things online to print, and those are toys. So there are some steps you need to take. So yeah, here's a car. You need lessons first. All right, I have I have one uh, 
question for Franz. I want to make sure that, uh, you know, what you can get across here in like 60 seconds or something. Um, on, I know that there's a lot of, uh, well, first of all, all of us being manufacturers and distributors, we won't be here if we don't, if there's not transportation to and from us between our suppliers and our customers, etc. So from the transportation side, and then there's also the energy side. So I don't know, I'm giving you a tall order in a, you know, and that was ten, ten words or less. <laughs> well, what, what uh, pearls of wisdom do you have on those topics that you could, I want to make well, sure we get them in. I think it's an innovative uh, opportunity. Uh, our funding sources, we're kind of stuck in the old days, and if we look at our education system, I think our infrastructure is pretty much the same. You know, we've been using uh, our interstate highways and uh, the processes that we've had in the past, and it's a new day. Uh, we have uh, have to figure out how we're going to fund our infrastructure, the old highway trust fund and our method of funding infrastructure is no longer appropriate. Our partners are building alternative fuel